Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, in just a few minutes, God is going to die. God is going to die and die horribly. And in the wake of God's violent, humiliating end, you will have some deciding to do. At God's funeral, you will have decisions to make. We as a species have done a lot of talking about the death of God. We thought about it, we sang about it, we wrote books about it. In his book, The Gay Science, Nietzsche imagined a madman who barrels screaming into a crowded market and he's carrying a lantern in broad daylight and he's screaming at everyone, where is God? And people laugh at him, they answer him with sarcasm until the madman explains that his question had been rhetorical. I mean to tell you, the madman screams, we have killed God. You and I, we are all his murderers. But How have we done it? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the whole horizon? Do we not hear the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell the divine putrefaction? For even God's putrefy. God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. How shall we console ourselves, the most murderous of all murderers? Nietzsche's oft-quoted and probably just as oft misunderstood pool quote, became an easy catchphrase for the goth and punk scene of my teenage world. God is dead. Edgy. Take that, mom. In 2003, author Philip Pullman said of his best-selling fantasy series, His Dark Materials, my books are about killing God. God, or something like him, is a villain in Pullman's stories, of whom it is said, the authority, God, the creator, the Lord, Yahweh, El, Adonai, the king, the father, the almighty, those were all names he gave himself. In Chuck Palahniuk's graphic novel sequel, Fight Club 3, Tyler Durden storms heaven ready to vanquish God with an arsenal of nukes. These are just a handful of examples, but we've done a lot of thinking and talking and writing about the death of God. And terrified of these pagan books and debauched punk bands and Nietzsche's huge mustache. Have you seen this thing? It's huge. Pearl-clutching Christians have long come to the defense of their very much not-dead God with comebacks like embarrassing movies and, (laughs) and a few solid zingers like God is dead, more like God is dad. Am I right? And while we're at it, Nietzsche, he's dead, you know? And of course, Nietzsche isn't here to say otherwise, so that's checkmate for him. Now, I won't pretend to not understand why anyone would ever be offended by Nietzsche or the golden compass, but there's something to all this talk about the death of God, and that's where we're going. In just a few minutes, God is going to die. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, we're going to revisit the same text that Hakeem unpacked last week and look at it through a different lens. This is sort of an important moment in the Bible, if you know anything about this story. So it's worth an extra sermon, I think. If we haven't met, my name is Josh Porter. I lead a little church just down the road in Vancouver called Van City that was planted by your church. So thanks for that. Uh, If you're new around here, you don't know this, but I used to work here. And since leaving, this is my 11th guest appearance at Bridgetown Church. But who's counting? Yeah. Me, apparently. And now, here's the thing. You guys get a lot of guest teachers around here. Many of them are famous and thus more noteworthy than yours, truly. I'm not after your sympathy or anything. It's just the way that it is. If you guys are going to have to hang in there anyway, do your best (laughs) to pay attention. You know, for me, this is big time stuff. Heck, until recently, your lead pastor, as it were, was none other than John Mark Quinton Time Comer, you know? (laughs) <laughs> I always leave him a present in the podcast. Um, internationally famous professional Christian, this guy. So this is big time stuff for me. Usually he has me here to teach like weird passages from the Bible about beheadings and incest or divisive topics like money and sweatshops, which I think is fun. And sometimes the Bridgetown admins forward me the angry emails, which I also think is fun. Now, this is no competition, uh, not much of one anyway, but the thing about teaching the Bible is that it's important that the audience, that's you, 
remembers what gets said up here. That's retention, what we in the business call retention. As disciples of Jesus, we're supposed to carry out our lives based on what we learn from this book. So we need to learn well, and I don't have to tell you, it is a complicated book. Not only all that, but this is your third week in a row studying the execution of Jesus. My God. So I have something to the tune of 40 minutes or less and and counting to teach you about one of the most important doctrines in the entire history of the Christian movement. And right now, I'm using up my time with this whole bit. Um, And I'm sure you can see right through me, my whole attempt at winning everyone over with levity, jokes about John Mark. It's it's very obvious, I'm sure, the warm-up. But things are about to get really intense, so I'm front-loading the humor. (laughs) Uh, Bethany and Hakeem, they have lots of smarts and good looks and charisma, and I've got dry humor and jokes about Nietzsche's mustache. So... We're doing the best we can. Are you guys ready? You ready to get into it? Great, thank you. This is where Matthew's wonderfully literary biography of Jesus reaches a fever pitch. Where you've left off, Jesus has been mocked and abused and let out and crucified. It's bad. But Matthew spares us the intimate details, the barbarism of the procedure. In fact, in Matthew's gospel, the crucifixion happens off screen, as it were. One minute they're offering Jesus the whole wine gall thing to drink, and then the next line is, when they had crucified him. It's as if Matthew can't bear to write about it, so he gets it over with quickly. But crucifixion was anything but quick. It was designed to take a very long time. The victim, suspended by rope or nails through the hands and feet, would typically asphyxiate slowly over the course of several agonizing hours or days. Unable to lift themselves enough to draw breath, the victim would succumb to the comprehensive trauma of suffocation, shark, sh- uh, shock, heart attack, thirst, sepsis, or all of these things working together slowly. Contrary to most artistic depictions, victims of crucifixion were stripped naked to further their humiliation. This was a visual display of their powerlessness against Roman military might. One first first century philosopher, Seneca the Younger, wrote that victims of crucifixion typically suffered a sharpened stick forced upward through their groin, creating this maddening struggle to suspend oneself against the exhaustion and inevitability of being lowered down on the spike, being impaled slowly. Another ancient Roman writer described, described crucifixion as a most cruel and disgusting punishment. The very mention of the cross should be far removed, not only from a Roman citizen's body, but from his mind, his eyes, his ears. It's a crime to bind a Roman citizen. To scourge him is a wickedness. To put him to death is almost parricide. What shall I say of crucifying him? So guilty an action cannot by any possibility be adequately expressed by any name bad enough for it. In fact, the root word of our English word, excruciating, is literally out of crucifying. This particular method of execution was designed not only to dispose of troublemakers, that was easy enough, but to inflict maximum physical, emotional, and psychological suffering, and to do so in the public square so that any and all observers would be stricken with horror and fear, thus dissuading would-be criminals and quell would-be rebellions against the Roman Empire, so that anyone seeing it as they passed by on the streets would say to themselves, if that's what happens when you mess with Rome, then forget it. But Matthew is creating this incredible literary meta-masterpiece in which the tragedy of Jesus' execution is contrasted in real time by the glory of his victory. And the reader is meant to be torn between these two overlapping realities, the horror and shame of Jesus being abandoned and ridiculed and tortured, dying in agony, and the awe-inspiring majesty of centuries of God's prophetic promises from Genesis to Malachi come to fruition in the most beautifully unexpected way of all. Matthew is a provocateur. He wants the reader to react viscerally. He wants them to respond. And Matthew is doing all this by weaving in language from the Psalms, from the prophet Isaiah, throughout the Hebrew scriptures to demonstrate this is it. This is is the serpent-crushing son of Eve from Genesis, the long-promised rescuing king from the Old Testament, the suffering servant of Isaiah. This moment of agony, this scene of suffering, has become the enthronement of Jesus, the Messiah and King. And the coronation continues. So look down at Matthew 27, and let's read beginning with verse 45. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. 
So this is a reference to an Old Testament promise. In that day, declares sovereign Yahweh, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your religious festivals into mourning and all your singing into weeping. I will make all of you wear sackcloth and shave your heads. I will make that time like mourning for an only son and the end of it like a bitter day. So the darkness represents God's anger. Yes, anger. And his grief. And it marks what scriptures call the day of the Lord. This is really serious stuff. Matthew is describing this moment with huge, sweeping, grandiose language to communicate to the reader the gravity of this thing that's happening. He could be using apocalyptic Hebrew imagery to communicate the darkness of the moment with symbolism. Or it could have been a strange, literal darkness over Palestine in the middle of the day. Who knows? Either way, this is it. Verse 46. About three in the afternoon... I'll pause for a minute. This scene is unfolding concurrently with the Passover festival in Jerusalem. Three o'clock was the time when the daily lamb was brought into the temple. So Matthew, again, weaving this incredible tapestry of Old Testament imagery and symbols to proclaim that what John the Baptist said of Jesus is true. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And verse 46 goes on. Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and then he says in Aramaic, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here, Jesus is quoting the first line of Psalm 22. And Matthew, for the first and last time in this biography of Jesus, documents the quotation not in Greek, the language that the rest of the biography is written in, but in Aramaic. He's drawing special attention to the sacredness of this moment and this statement to the degree that he must present the words exactly as Jesus said them. To take on the true horror of evil and justice and hell, Jesus must see it through to the harrowing pit of despair. Jesus' suffering is now complete. If Jesus had felt enveloped in the loving comfort of God while on the cross, if he had been zen, at peace, then his pivotal moment of confronting the darkness of evil and death would have been at least partially anesthetized. But Jesus is facing the true horror of physical, emotional, and spiritual dereliction. The horror is so profound that people rush to excuse what Jesus says away. Surely Jesus didn't mean to say that he felt abandoned by God, they say. In his commentary on the passage, scholar Frederick Dale Bruner writes, why can't we allow Jesus to say abandoned when he feels, thinks, sees, and believes himself abandoned? Jesus' loneliness is now complete. This is the deepest darkness of all. When God's presence goes, the lights go out. Jesus is not only surrounded by outward darkness, he does not inwardly feel God's presence at all. He dies before he dies. This is Jesus' descent into hell. And don't many of us know a feeling like this, if not as deep, not as dark, but to some extent in our own lives? Haven't many of us also felt abandoned by God. And this is why the author of Hebrews would later write, as a comfort to the church, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Jesus knows our pain and more of it, all of our pain. So Bruner adds, Jesus' last words before death teach us the gospel within the gospel. They teach us that, or they tell us that Jesus took on our abandonment, our questions, our feelings of God's betrayal, our most agonizing experiences, and still believed in the God he could feel and was surely tempted to disbelieve. And the story goes on, verse 47. When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. Silly as it sounds, the Aramaic word Eli sounds like Elijah. So Elijah, who in the Old Testament, if you know the story, he doesn't so much as die proper as ride off to heaven in a chariot. It's a whole thing. And then in Jewish folklore, Elijah would ride out of heaven to rescue troubled Israelites. So thinking that Jesus is screaming, Elijah, Elijah, has suddenly seized everyone's attention. But then in verse 50, when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So in a sudden 
cataclysmic event, God demonstrates judgment and salvation concurrently. The temple establishment, the religious institution of ancient Israel that conspired to kill Jesus, is condemned in a supernatural act of destruction. The curtain of the temple was an enormous heavy veil that closed off what was called the Holy of Holies. It was a sacred space that was said to house God's unique presence. And it was yet inaccessible to all but one male and then only once a year on a day called Yom Kippur. It was the whole thing. The high priest wore a rope around his leg so that if he died from the sheer magnitude of his experience in the Holy of Holies, the other guys could pull his corpse out by the rope, which would be a huge drag. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry. Again, this is a heavy teaching, and I'm searching for jokes, honestly. Albeit dark ones. I'm not that sorry because I love that joke. I've told it a lot of times. Now, the point is that the tearing of the curtain was more than just a pronouncement of judgment on the religious establishment. It was the symbolic announcement of salvation for all people. The divide between God and humanity has been torn apart by Jesus' death on the cross. And then things get really weird. Keep reading in verse 51. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, this is admittedly weird in a book that's already really weird. Some scholars argue that Matthew might be temporarily taking up ancient Jewish literary genre called apocalyptic. Uh, an apocalypse is a Greek word that means to uncover or to reveal. In the Bible, an apocalypse is a revelation of a divine perspective. It is, in the language of Dr. Tim Mackey, our friend over at the Bible Project, written in a poetic, imaginative style, packed with symbolism and based on biblical design patterns. Now, the reason that some people suspect a sudden apocalyptic flourish here is not because they simply can't believe that dead people came back to life. If you've got a problem with that, then spoiler alert, you're not going to like where this story is going. <laughs> the reason is that the Bible also paints a picture of Jesus as the first fruits of resurrection, meaning that Jesus is the unique original instance of a dead person doing more than being resuscitated, but passing through death completely and being restored to life in a glorified physical body. The difference is that the people that Jesus raised back to life, they were resuscitated and they died again. The resurrected Jesus will not die again. So it could be the case that Matthew, like Daniel in the Old Testament or John in Revelation, is using this highly stylized symbolic imagery familiar to his Jewish audience to powerfully communicate that this is the moment when death was being undone by Jesus' work on the cross. Either way, the same truth applies. And whether symbolic or literal, in the midst of this incredible succession of events, darkness, earthquakes, the curtain torn, we read in verse 54, when the centurion and those, who, uh, those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. As usual, in the presence of overwhelming doubt and disregard, Jesus manages to find belief in the most unlikely of places. And that's the story. Next in Matthew's gospel comes an event that's legitimacy or lack thereof divides the entire world but on this, the death of Jesus, the overwhelming majority of scholars and historians, Christian and non-Christian, agree. Jesus of Nazareth was an actual person of history, and he was executed by crucifixion under Pontius Pilate as an enemy of the state. A number of ancient sources outside of the New Testament and the early Christian writings mention this, but my absolute favorite is a work of artistic blasphemy. It's called the Alexamenos Graffito. It's a piece of vandalism found scratched in the plaster of a home in Rome as early as the first century. And the image mocks an early Christian who's genuflected in worship before a man on a cross with the head of a mule. And the inscription reads, Alexamenos worships his God. This is likely, we think, the earliest known image of Jesus or of the Christian movement. A parody, a mockery. And I think that this satire should be recognized by the church as an icon to inspire worship. It's hard to imagine an image that could capture the subversive beauty of this story with as much exquisite, sublime excellence. Everything about it makes sense. Worshiping a criminal that was pathetic pathetically and humiliatingly brought to absolute ruin by the empire on the accusations of his own people is more than ridiculous. It borders on insane. 
that a movement grew from ancient Judaism in which monotheists, people who believed in one God and would not even say the name of God aloud, began to worship an executed criminal human as God himself frustrates the minds of historians unable to close a profound gap in this bizarre story. The early Christians abandoned their worldviews, their ways of life for an executed criminal with nothing to gain but trouble, persecution, and even death. There was no global movement then. No one was raised up to believe these things in the church. There was no cultural pressure to buy into such a ridiculous oxymoron as a crucified Messiah. Swiss theologian Ulrich Luz writes, As the sent one of God and as the messianic king, Jesus is now for outsiders definitively destroyed. A messianic king on a cross who was not victoriously overcome, a miraculous healer who cannot rescue himself, an intimate of God whom God leaves in the lurch, a divine man who does not incarnate strength in life. This is a laughable figure. But something happened. Something happened that the world could not understand, and Alex Zamanos worshiping this crucified criminal to the mockery of his peers, immortalized on the wall of some Roman home hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The world didn't understand then, and the world doesn't understand now. It makes perfect sense that this is wonderfully encapsulated in this work of art, albeit small and mean-spirited. It is unintentionally, theologically astute. Now, when we church people talk about the cross, we tend to talk about all the fire and brimstone sounding stuff like wrath and judgment and hell. In fact, I'm about to talk about that kind of stuff. But before I do, let me just say that I know as well as anyone that our track record when it comes to handling sensitive, sensitive topics like these isn't the best. Um, I'm from Georgia. I grew up Southern Baptist. I was given topics like judgment and hell with all the theological sensitivity of a sledgehammer. So, and then I saw it with my own eyes in a judgment house as a teenager. Do you guys have a judgment house? Do you know about judgment house, Gerald? You know about that? You've heard about it. Bethany knows. I was about to say, I guarantee she was in one. Yep. I played teenager in hell number two. No. Yep. Uh, anyway, you don't know what it is. Let me explain it to you real quick. It's basically, <laughs> it's the evangelical answer to a haunted house at Halloween time. This was usually when we hosted them or went to them. So you walk through this dark maze and the teenage church actors, they depict like a suicide or a drug overdose or something, which ironically is way more horrifying than a guy in a hockey mask at the secular haunted house across the street. But what do I know? And uh, (laughs) in the play, a Christian kid also dies in a car wreck or some tragedy. And one goes to heaven, the other goes to hell, and you walk through your youth group to see both of their fates. And then you have to make a decision about your soul at the end. Hell, it turns out, is a rave. Uh, with goth kids and black lights and uh, heaven is a bunch of cotton balls and worship music and people in choir robes hugging and stuff and um, no one wants to say as much out loud but a terrible realization begins to move through the crowd like heaven seems boring at least in hell they have a dj you know and (laughs) i'm ashamed to admit it i've been in more more than one of these things just as a bystander i didn't participate like bethany did Uh, yeah, I kid you not, in one of the more upscale judgment houses, the megachurch judgment house, hell had the little, like, lamp bowls with the paper fire, you know, and uh, Satan was sprawled out on this black throne, and and they were playing Slayer in hell, and I don't know whose idea this was, playing Slayer in hell, but I watched two two teenage metalheads uh, walk into hell, recognize Slayer immediately, and they were like, yeah, and started nodding along. (laughs) I was like, oops, no way these guys are raising their hands to get saved at the end. Not even with every head bowed and every eye closed. Uh, All they had in heaven was Michael W. Smith, which I think is, (laughs) I think he's just as awesome as Slayer, just in a different way. Right, Gerald? Two different kinds of things. These other guys, I'm sure, needed some convincing. Anyway, where are we? (laughs) Oh, right. The cross raises topics like wrath and judgment, and hell. And no, we're not always great at hashing these things out, but the truth is that the cross is a shocking, provocative story that demands an incredible high-stakes response from the reader, be it devotion or indifference, both equally high stakes. The wretchedness of the cross, the brutality and humiliation of it was somehow understood by the early Christians as the most sacred event in human history. 
And this is our story, a story that began with the human project run off the rails by our own selfish brokenness. All of us contribute in ways big and small to the awful state of the world. So for God to remove evil, we'd have to be uprooted with it, but God didn't want to do that. And so God, the artist, began to introduce symbols and symbolic acts to his people that communicated both the awful toll of evil and the incredible graciousness of God. These symbolic acts seem strange to the modern mind, but to ancient Israel, God allowing an animal to die in the place of guilty humans was a visceral, tactile symbol of death as the consequence of sin and of God's mercy in sacrificing something other than us to remove sin from our midst. As bizarre as it sounds now, a priest sprinkling the blood of an animal within the temple, blood that represented life, was a meaningful symbol of God's costly sacrificial love as powerfully capable of removing, washing away evil and its consequences through death. And this was intended to shape the hearts and minds of God's people so that they might become a people of justice who cared for the poor and the oppressed, who demonstrated God's kingship and great love to the entire world, But people, time and time again, proved incapable of goodness. The decomposing human project waited for a promised king, a rescuer to succeed in Israel's failure and to realize their long-abandoned task of enacting God's gracious kingship over the world. And so God, the artist, lover of profound symbols and powerfully demonstrative imagery, brings his story to a harrowing apex in Jesus who takes up the mantle of Israel's long-awaited anointed king, but by serving rather than lording over others and in the words of the prophet Isaiah to give his life as a ransom for many, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the sacrifice that demonstrates the destructive consequences of evil, the sacrifice that absorbs those consequences in order to rescue those who deserve to be destroyed by them. And instead, destroy the powers of evil and darkness in the process. And this happened, the crucifixion of Jesus. And this continues to happen, the worship of the crucified criminal. Theologian Karl Barth wrote, The passion of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of man's revelio and of God's wrath, yet also his mercy, did not take place in heaven or in some remote planet or even in some world of ideals. It took place in our time, in the center of world history in which our human life is played out. God has come into our life in its utter loneliness and frightfulness. We are not left alone in this frightful world. Into this alien land, God has come to us. The crucifixion of Jesus is not an unexpected tragedy. It's the linchpin moment in the Bible's meta-narrative to which centuries of writing and prophetic wisdom had been pointing all along. For centuries, God had pledged to do something about the awful state of the world and the awful state of life in general in what we call the world. And in every step of this unfolding masterwork, with every layer of creative genius and cosmic profundity, the world overlooked what God was doing. It's not the kind of plan that we would have designed were it up to us. We would likely not have the king of the universe born in a manger surrounded by manure and livestock, a king who came to serve rather than be served. We would never have dreamed of a crucified Messiah, a God who dies. But here we are. God's plan is so unlike ours because God is so unlike us. God is supreme, selfless, self-sacrificial love, and we are not. Howard Ross summarizes this perfectly. He said, we are spared because God refuses to have us lost. Such is God's justice. But this story isn't about God only, it's about you and me. Before this, the arrest, the betrayal, before the soldiers and the whips and the thorns, before the nails in his hands and feet, Jesus said to his disciples, his unassuming and clueless disciples like you and I, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. And so God is dead Now it's your turn. Everyone is going to have to die. And this dying, all of us have to do, is the greatest test, the greatest barrier between you and faithfulness to the way of Jesus. Of the million things we could talk about when we read the story of the cross, to end this morning, I want to go here. 
What does it mean to take up your cross now? In our world of venerated deconversion, the be true to yourself mantra is the banner under which innumerable former Christians are heading toward the church exits. The cross continues to alienate. Jesus is fine if he doesn't tell us what to do. Or he can tell us what to do just as long as we like what we hear, as long as it feels right. Both conservative and progressive quasi-Christians do this. Everyone is fine with Jesus correcting people they don't like. The right is happy to have Jesus lecture the left about gender and sexual identity, but they don't want to hear Jesus talk about porn or divorce or money or the poor and the oppressed. And the left really wants Jesus to give the conservatives a stern talking to when it comes to social justice and racism, but he better keep his sex ethics to himself. It just doesn't feel right. And yet, denying what often feels right, denying ourselves some of the things we want most in life in order to obey Jesus is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. And if you don't do it, you cannot follow Jesus. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross, all the horror of their cross, and follow me. Everyone is going to have to die. For many... The cross is little more than jewelry. It's a print for leggings or the decorative adornment perched atop an old church building. For centuries, we have so romanticized the cross that it no longer holds any scandal for us. For us, the cross is a thing of beauty or a thing without consequence, an icon so familiar it becomes beige wallpaper. We have memorized the image of forlorn Jesus stretched out in the shape of a T, his sad puppy dog eyes embossed in pewter jewelry printed on candles, pixelated in memes, but the cross was contemptible. Don't imagine Jesus handsome and forlorn, but his eyes blackened and swollen shut. Don't imagine Jesus' lean marble body stretched across smooth wood, but his shivering frame split and convulsing, flies gathering in his wet, exposed tissue. Don't imagine Jesus in a satin loincloth, but naked and humiliated, likely soiling himself by all historical records, aware that his mom was being made to watch the whole thing. To us, the cross is romantic, it's pregnant with symbolism, and it's beautifully meaningful resonance to the way of Jesus. And that's not all bad, that's true. But it was not that way to Peter when Jesus first brought it up. It was not that way to the other apostles when he said, take up your cross and follow me. To them, the cross was more than defeat. It was the misery, shame, suffering, and humiliation of a criminal condemned condemned to death, which is exactly what God became in Jesus and here in our text right now in the story. God is dead, and now it's your turn. For many throughout the centuries of the way of Jesus, this has been a literal death and continues to be so across the world. But for every disciple of Jesus, it is a kind of death through self-denial, the least popular in all the modern world of Jesus' teachings. No teaching of Jesus comes with such aggravated offense to the modern sensibility as self-denial. The gospel of our culture is self-fulfillment. The gospel of social media is narcissistic self-celebration. The gospel of entitlement assures us that we deserve comfort and security and entertainment and bells and whistles. If something disrupts said comfort, we have ways of fighting back against it. More screens, more feeds, outlets for outrage and complaint, pills, apps, porn, the pursuit of happiness in the American way. We might deny ourselves in the name of a diet or a career to look good or to make money, but it is very difficult for us to conceive of a happy, fulfilled life that does not include us getting what we want on our terms. We are terrified that if we are denied our dreams or a soapbox on which to speak, if we cannot sleep with the person of our choosing, we are somehow less human. Nearly everything in the post-Christian cultural milieu screams at us that self-denial is oppression and that self-fulfillment is the only way to authentic happiness and truth. And yet, here stands Jesus then and now. Everyone must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Everyone is going to have to die. To say yes to Jesus is to say no to innumerable competing options. 
No to shopping however I want, spending my money however I want, eating however I want. No to hyper-individualism. No to social media image curation. No to me first. No to careerism. No to getting ahead. No to being liked all the time. No to the American dream. No to my sexuality expressed however I want. The contemplative Quaker Thomas Kelly wrote, Nothing else in all of heaven or earth counts so much as his will, his slightest wish, his faintest breathing. Holy obedience sets in, sensitive as a shadow, obedient as a shadow, selfless as a shadow. Not reluctantly, but with ardor, one longs to follow him. Gladly, urgently, promptly, one leaps to do his bidding, ready to run and not be weary and to walk and not faint. The disciple of Jesus, by definition, says to his or her master, what you say I will do. Where you say to go, I will go. You are the master. I am the apprentice, not the other way around. And many of us treat God as if he is a domesticated pet. We keep him around to gratify us and pet him on the head, but to do our bidding. And I think of Paul's words, God is not mocked. If you qualify your willingness to follow Jesus by saying, but you can't have this part of me, then you cannot follow Jesus because he is leading you to a cross to die. That is the prerequisite to discipleship. Of course, it's easy to pick on our culture's apprehensiveness apprehensiveness to the invitation of Jesus. But it was a tough sell back in the first century as well. Jesus knew then and now that the invitation to take up your cross would be widely rejected, if not by most people who hear it. And of this inevitability, Jesus said, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life from me will find it trademark Jesus candidness. There are, these are the options, the only two options. This is the invitation of Jesus, and it begins with a cross. Dietrich Bonhoeffer famously paraphrased Jesus in his book, The Cost of Discipleship. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. All of discipleship is predicated on our ability or inability to realize this prerequisite. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Dallas Willard described self-denial as the overall settled condition of life in the kingdom of God, better described as death to self. In this and this alone lies the key to the soul's restoration. Christian spirituality or Christian spiritual formation rests on this indispensable foundation of death to self and cannot proceed except insofar as that foundation is being firmly laid and sustained. What Jesus called life to the fullest can never be realized except through the narrowing crucible of self-denial. Everyone is going to have to die. A popular strategy today uh, for silencing one's political or social media opponents is to leverage pain and injustice as the primary qualifications for who is able to comment on what. In this system, easy for you to say, becomes the immediate and final discrediting of anyone deemed unworthy of speaking. Whoever suffers the most is the most qualified and worthy to speak. Lives of comfort and privilege nullify the opinions of the unworthy. And I believe in the existence of privilege and the necessary nuance of empathy and listening. But I take comfort in the knowledge that within Christianity, all of us have a lot of dying to do. The way of Jesus becomes a shared experience of painful growth and maturity for every apprentice who accepts the invitation to lift their heavy cross. There will be seasons of life in which it seems like you are paying more than someone else when it seems as if your cross is heavier or heaviest. We all have desires, things that we believe we need to make us happy, and we point frustrated fingers at other people and cry, hey, they're dying less than me. But forget the imperfection and chaos of your brothers and sisters in Christ and remember this, God did the dying first. He is who you are called to emulate, not anyone else. But you don't understand how much is being asked of me. I'd have to give up a relationship or an identity or a fortune or a dream or a career, come and die. But I would have to wake up earlier, change my habits and change my life, come and die. But how much will God require? I don't want to let God into this part of me. I don't want him to ask this of me. How much will Jesus ask? All of it. All of you. Everything. 
This is not a self-help seminar. This is not a weekend retreat. To follow Jesus, everything must bow beneath the master. It will be rearranged and edited and transformed, and much of it will simply have to die. How can so high a demand and so grave an ask possibly be good? Because the all-powerful creator God of the universe emptied himself into nothing, was naked and powerless, stripped bare, and laid open unto total desolation and abandonment as the ultimate masterwork of wild, beautiful, self-sacrificial love for you so that you could inherit his kingdom as beloved sons and daughters of the king. And this incredible, seemingly too-good-to-be-true story has endured for more than 2,000 years at the heart of the Jesus movement, precious to those who follow him, all shapes and sizes and colors and stories from all over the world, uniting the broken rabble of humanity in the beauty and imperfection of the church around the power of this incredible rebellion. Jesus died that we might live. Now we will die that we might live for him. He's that good, and we want him that bad. The God of the universe gave everything over to death in order to love us first. And he asks for our reciprocation. And then we qualify our willingness to follow him. I'll be a Christian, but only if. Well, you can't. Not without dying. It often seems as if there's a digital ticker tape parade for the courageous individual who denounces faith. They write books, they start podcasts, they publish blogs, they make a lot of money doing it. But bailing out is easy. Anyone can do that. Many people do. They've been doing it for hundreds of years. Faithfulness is difficult and faithfulness is costly. This is why in all four gospels, we read the central prerequisite for disciple to Jesus is deny yourself take up your cross and follow me. In fact, in Luke's gospel, he even adds an extra line, take up your cross and follow me daily. Augustine believed that humans are made in God's image, but that when we allow our desires to become disordered, we suffer as a result. Freud argued that human beings are animals compelled by instinct for pleasure and that when we repress our desires, we suffer as a result. Not doing what you want to do, well, that's inauthentic. There are no hashtags for such a thing. The disciple of Jesus embarks on the lifelong work of crucifying the old self, not entertaining or placating or coddling every desire. Instead, we cultivate, nurture, and develop the things of the spirit. And the things of the flesh, we nail to a stake and leave for dead again and again and again. And on that same stake hangs the mantras of the flesh, be true to yourself, hashtag do what makes you happy, follow your heart, left to rot with the old self. Again and again, day after day, Jesus was crucified to show us how, and now we follow in his example. This is a way of life. We are so like small children before God, our Father. You don't have to be a parent to recognize this familiar picture. A child unwilling to try that new bite of food or open their eyes before an image they worry will frighten them or to put a foot in the water or to hold a frog or to board a roller coaster, whatever it might be. And the parent beside them assuring, pleading, trust me, the parent who knows the child better than they know themselves. And like children, you and I fret, kneading our knuckles and unable to imagine that God might actually be after our joy. He wants us to be well-behaved, stoic, spiritual, benevolent, sure, we can believe that. But joy, we are less convinced. Ignatius of Loyola once defined sin as the unwillingness to trust that what God wants is our deepest happiness. I no longer feel fit to carry the weight of my own satisfaction. I do not want to attempt to satiate that profound longing with things that spoil and that spoil me. This wrestling inside me, the warfare in here and out there, all of it hangs on this. Our ability to look into the eyes of God the Father with trust and taking his hand, allow him to lead us into life, hope, future, peace, goodness, joy, and love, even though he will first lead us to a cross.